Hi, Skillful Teachers, and welcome back to Skillful Teaching with Dr. Angela, where my goal is to motivate, inspire, and uplift teachers everywhere. If you're new here, I'm Angela McCord, Skillful Teacher and Education Consultant. Thanks for watching and be sure to check out my premiere video where I talk about what this channel is all about. Today for Math Chat Monday, so you want to be a department chair? I have an interview with a department chair. He's gonna talk to us all about the ins and outs of being a department chair. So sit back and listen to the interview with Mr. Willie Frierson, and he is a high school math teacher and department chair. Thank you, Mr. Frierson, for joining us on Skillful Teaching with Dr. Angela. I really appreciate you taking the time out to chat with us today on Math Chat Monday. And we're gonna jump right into our interview. So, Mr. Frierson, first of all, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, first, thank you for having me, Dr. Angela. I really appreciate being here. Uh, my name is Willie Frierson. Uh, I'm finishing up my 25th year at teaching, 20 years at Irmo High School. I have a wife who, who I've been married to for 25 years, and I have three kids, two boys and a, well, two men, and a spoiled 23-year-old <laughs> girl who just happened to got this little one right here. Oh my goodness! Cute yeah, so another another family member. I've taught in Richland one for five years. I was at Lower Richland for four, and Gibbs Middle School for one year. But twenty years at Irmo High School. Wow, that is awesome, Mr. Frierson. Tell us a little bit about the experience that you think prepared you um, to become a math department chair. Well, uh, the main answer to that question would be that I've taught all different levels of math. I taught um, Algebra 1. I mean, before it was Algebra 1 Part 1, Algebra 1 Part 2. I've taught the lowest classes that they were in high school. But I've also taught Pre-Cal Honors, Algebra 2 Honors. So I think that's important for, for all department chairs, math department chairs to do, so you can understand exactly what your teachers are going through with the classes that they are teaching. Ah, and probably the progression, um, too, that students have going from one course to the next. Do you think that was important, having that understanding? Absolutely, because I, I, um, I understood exactly what concept they needed to be well-versed at in order to be successful in a higher-level class. So when I'm teaching pre-cal honors, I knew exactly what they should have known or have been taught before they started taking pre-cal honors. And that helped me when I was an algebra two honors teacher to make sure that all that material was covered before they got to uh, pre-cal honors. Tell me a little bit about the duties that you have as a math department chair, duties and responsibilities. Well, uh, one of the biggest responsibilities I think is being a cheerleader for everyone in your department. I have to go and do their evaluations. Um, I have to actually sit down in a classroom and watch them teach and give them feedback. You know, whatever I think might help them out. And most of the time, everything is always positive. You know, it's always positive. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. I might mention something that I saw that, you know, you might want to work on. But, but bottom line is I'm being an advocate for the teachers. You know, I'm also like the middleman between the math teachers and the administrators. So if they have a, a problem or concern or something like that, they bring it to me and then I have a conversation with the administrators and we work things out that way. It's just like I'm part of the chain of command. Okay, awesome. So if they have trouble or a problem, then they feel like they can come to you first. Yes. Yes. That's awesome. And I said evaluation earlier. The word I was really looking for was observation. So when I do classroom observations. Okay. So what you're saying is in your role, you observe and give that needed feedback for growth and motivation 
but that's different, very different from evaluations that administrators do that um, are going to go at their professional level. Yes, very much so. Now we also have like first year and second year teachers where, you know, I have to mentor them and I have to, you know, evaluate them for their certificates. I'm also a part of that team. So uh, that aspect, I do evaluations, but with every other teacher, it's just observations. Okay. So for the seasoned teachers, observations, and for the new teachers, evaluations. Yes, ma'am. Tell us what have you learned in this role as a math department chair? Well, the biggest thing I think I've learned is how hard it is to put a schedule together for 13 or 14 math teachers for the, the API. They have to schedule it where, you know, algebra one classes meet this block and geometry classes and algebra two. And, you know, we have like an IB program and an AP program and, and some kids taking IB classes and, and they have a couple of A, you know, AP classes and you got to make sure that, you know, their schedules will work out. You can't have like two IB classes at the same time, like an IB math and an IB chemistry class because some student might need to take both of those classes. The biggest thing I've learned was how hard it is to come up with a schedule. You actually work with the API to help develop that schedule and getting the kids in the appropriate classes. Somewhat, yes, we do. I try to help her decide what classes each teacher should be teaching. Let's say we have 250 Algebra 1 students and we want to have Algebra 1 classes, uh, no more than 14 students. So then I have to say, okay, we need 15 or 16 Algebra 1 classes. And then I have to say, okay, uh, Mr. Fryer's going to teach three Algebra 1 classes and, and this teacher teach two Algebra 1 and, and I spread it out like that. And, and it's just a recommendation, but it, it makes her job a little bit easier at her end. That is a huge responsibility. So it's kind of like you have to keep a pulse on the teachers and their teaching and instruction like to know well you know Angela may be good at this she, she should teach geometry uh, versus you know pre-cal or you know things like that exactly and of course teachers have you know their their dream class that they want to teach so you try to give them <laughs> that but but you, you also understand that you might have some other teachers some seasoned teachers some veteran teachers some teachers who who do really well with honors classes and you want to make sure that they have the honors classes and the AP classes and IB classes. So sometimes, you know, with that, if you're top heavy, sometimes teachers don't teach exactly what they want. Okay. Sounds like the ones on the, the low end of the totem pole may have to wait. <laughs> sometimes. Yes, yes. I've been there. I've been there. Yeah, the low end yeah, for a we, long time. yeah. We've all been there. That's usually how it goes. Yeah. Yes. You talked about scheduling and how um, that's a huge responsibility. Also yeah. helping to place teachers, deciding on what they're going to teach, helping with that insight. Let, let's talk a little bit about um, instruction. I know that um, when I work with schools myself as a consultant we usually mm -hmm. focus on algebra one a lot no matter what state i'm in that course because there's an end of course and mm -hmm. usually tied to the school's performance everybody is focusing on that it's so much more um important than just being able to pass that test you know mm -hmm. to me the course really is more about thinking it's about thinking and problem solving and just a lot of factors that you learn in the over the course of Algebra One can really help you with um, just thinking through problems in everyday life. With that being said, do you guys have any strategies or any protocols or anything that you've come up with to zero in on helping with um, instruction or bettering student outcomes? One thing we came up with in Algebra 1 is um, we have four different ways that we want our students to be able to represent an algebraic function. Okay. We want them to be able to represent them as an equation, as a table, as a graph, and we also want them to be able to write them as a real life situation. So um, we want our students to, to know that how all four of those come together. I feel personally that it's helped the students realize that, you know, those all go together. We had this one project and I'm not gonna, you know, talk too much about it, but uh, it's a fair project. And students could pay either a certain price to get in the fair 
and then the um the price of the tickets for the rides were cheaper or maybe they go in free and they would have to pay more for the rides and and we this is when we were doing um uh systems and they need to come up with an idea of you know if you plan on riding this many rides it's best to go on a free day and pay more for the rides but if you plan on riding you know this number of rides it's best to pay money to go in and then pay a smaller price per ride. And we had to have students come up with, you know, that intersection point and they had to do it, you know, algebraically, you know, we wanted them to do it by graphing. We wanted them to talk about, well, obviously we gave them the real life situation, mm -hmm. but that's one way that we tied in everything together. And the kids sort of liked it. It was talking hopefully, about the fair. So you know hopefully that was around the time that um, the fair was, there too. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, do you guys look at data in any form or fashion? Do you feel like that helps you um, and your team as a math department chair? I feel like data teams with the algebra one really helps a lot because we take the pretest and we know exactly what our kids are lacking in when we first start a unit. A unit. So we concentrate obviously on that more. Uh, we sit together, we come up with strategies, you know. Uh, we have some teachers who've been in the Algebra 1 data teams for four, five, six years, and, and they'll come up and they'll say, well, this worked for me, or maybe I tried this uh, two years ago and I didn't like the way that worked, so maybe we need to try something different. So we all sit together and we come up with strategies and, and um, we use that to, to drive instruction. I'm gonna end this with uh, a little strategy. Um, okay. called Three Truths and a Lie. So normally we have this in the classroom for instruction and it can be um, sort of like a ticket out the door it's just to make sure students understand or whatever. But I just felt like I'd mix it up and throw it in here um, okay. for a little engagement. So some people may you know, know about responsibilities for a math department chair and they may have different ideas and think one thing and may not know. So we're going to let you set the record straight for us with three truths and one lie. So tell us three truths about a math department chair and one lie. All right. So the first truth I would say is um, you should be really good in all of the different subjects that's in the math department. Might not like, might not like them all, but you should be, you know, pretty good. I mean, I can do anything from algebra one all the way up to the IB classes that we have at school. Now, the stats, I'm not a big fan of. I don't really particularly <laughs> like stats, but I could do it. You know, I might have to look some stuff up, but I mean, I, I, I tutor in stats, so I can do stats. So you should be, you should have a knowledge. I mean, if, if all you can really do is algebra one and geometry, then the uh, department chair might not be for you. You should be a people person, okay? Um, not all of the department chairs I've had have been people person, but nine out of 10 have, okay? So they get along with, you know, people in their department. They're, they're able to talk to them, you know. They, anytime somebody wants to come talk to me, or they can come in my room and we can have a conversation, you know. Um, I'm open to them. If, if someone comes up to you and have a question, and it bothers you and oh, I don't really want to talk, then that's not a good department chair. You got to be open and available everyone in your department. You have to be able to talk with administrators, okay? You should be able to just, if you have a question or comment or something, just to speak up and let them know exactly, you know, what you feel or what your department feel, what you heard, you know, you, you should be able to communicate with them. Makes sense. Yeah. Now one... the lie, the lie <laughs> is gonna be easy. The okay. lie is gonna be easy. Just because you're a department chair doesn't mean you have the best schedule in the department. Ah, that's a good one. That's yeah. a good one. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. Wow. Uh, for, the, for the past couple of years, um, just because I know, what my I know what teachers in my department like to teach and everything like that, and I know what they don't like to teach. Like, uh, sometimes I take classes that they might not want to teach. You just got to be that type of person. You know, you, <laughs> you just can't teach upper level honors classes and everything like that. You got to make sure you, you're teaching uh, all the classes. And that's why it's so good when you start out, you know, bottom of the totem pole, and you're teaching those low classes, and then you eventually get your, your gifted certificate, and you can teach honors classes, you move up. AP. But, and <laughs> yeah, you, you got an AP certifications, but you yeah. got to be able to teach all class, 
obviously I don't teach just honors classes. I teach a lot of algebra one. In fact, right now I'm only teaching algebra one class. So that's a part of being a people person, I'm sure. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Frierson. I really appreciate you coming on to my channel and sharing during this math chat, letting us know about the roles and responsibilities of a math department chair. Um, any final words that you'd like to say? Just keep teaching those kids math. Math is fun. Make sure they love it. It's important. Uh, I know you hear all the time, you know, why do I need this? When am I going to use this in life? Just make sure that they know um, whatever job they might have in the future, their employer want to make sure if I teach them something that they're going to be able to, you know, retain this information. And that's exactly what school is about. You know, if, if you're making a 70 in high school, that means you retain 70% of the information you taught. And if I'm a, your boss or your prospective boss at a job and I see you making 70s, then I'm thinking to myself, you know, I should get someone who will remember more, retain more of the information that I give them. Uh, it's not necessarily that everyone's going to be a mathematician or an engineer or something like that. And yet yeah, sometimes you might not need th this math later on in life, but you never know what you're going to do. So you take these math classes so your options are still open. So when I turned 20, 21, and hey, I want to be a chemical engineer, but I didn't take anything above geometry in high school, that's not going to be good. So you <laughs> want to keep your options open and make sure that you don't close any doors while you're in high school. So thanks again, Mr. Fryerson, and we really appreciate it. Thank you, skillful teachers, for watching, because we know that quality teaching is quality education. Thank you, Dr. Angela. What questions do you have about being a math department chair? Are you interested? Drop them down in the comment section below, and we'll be sure to answer. And if you're a middle school teacher, you're going to love my next math chat. Link.